guess what came in the mail today. I am very excited. Um, I'm very excited to open this package uh, because I'm very excited to show it to you. So for those of you who haven't been following along, I saw a piece on an auction site um, earlier or later last week. And when I saw it, I was relatively sure that I had seen that exact same piece before. Um, I'm talking about an apron. And I was relatively sure I had seen that exact apron before in something that I was recently, uh, something that I was recently doing some research on. So when I see an actual piece that reminds me of something I've been recently doing research on, it gets me really, really excited. And because I really like aprons, um, it goes with all of the uh, very domestic uh, type of clothing that I generally do my greatest part of my research on. So I was very excited to see this little apron on the auction site. And I decided that I was going to get it. So we're hoping this is what this is. I think that's what it is. Uh, that's what the tracking thing said it was. So I'm getting ready to open it up. I hope everyone is as excited as I am for this because I'm very excited to show you because this is a very different apron than probably any of them you have seen before. There it is. Excitement, all the excitement. So this particular apron, oh, reaching over here to get rid of the tape where it's not gonna get onto anything. Okay, so this particular apron um, is, the date on it will be right in the early 1890s. So the pattern was released in 1891. a small strange thing in their box with it. I'll set that aside because we have had small strange things in the past that were definitely important to my research. Um, the small strange thing in the past that was important to my research was I actually bought a work dress one time that had chicken feed in the pocket. So that's pretty nifty. And so here it is. And just because I knew this was 1891, I put a dress from the early 1890s on my mannequin, an actual dress from my collection, so that we could put the apron on the dress. So, this is lovely. Machine stitched, bias finished. I'm very excited. Are you guys dying? I am, I'm very excited. Great pockets. Look at the pockets on this dress, on this rascal. Is that not an awesome pocket? I also really like this pointed yoke on the waistband of it. Smells a little musty, so it won't go back in a box right away. Oh, look at these buttons. These are fantastic. Pardon my scooching tables around, but see the little flecks of color in those buttons? think they're hard rubber. I think. But I mean, the buttons just, they really, really match. I probably ought to put some light on, shouldn't I? Mm. 
and give me a little bit better light. So, buttons. And isn't this fun trim fabric? All bias. All right. So the reason I was really excited, do you want to, shall I do? Oh, I can't decide. Should I show you the picture first or should I put it on first? I'm going to put this on the dress mannequin and then I'll turn it so you can see why I've been so excited. I chose the one that had my mannequin with arms for a reason. to hope that it fits decently. buttons. It's going to need to be smoothed and pressed out. Get the sleeve bulk out from underneath. I also chose a sturdy. Here, let me turn this a little bit better. There we go. So I also chose one of my sturdy dresses because I didn't want it to damage the dress either. All right. So look at this lovely little lapels. So this is the fun part. Look how this closes in the back. Is this not just darling? Isn't this a beautiful, beautiful apron? So full coverage, full length coverage. So you can see it comes way down. Tilt that a little bit more. So we've got full length coverage. We've got this lovely full coverage front, but it's got these adorable little lapels. We have a pointed front yoke on there so that it's slimming. So all of the bulk is not right at your waistline. It drops it down a little bit. Um, it's just, it's just cute as a button. It really, really, really is. And then on the back, I mean, this is a nice full, full coverage kitchen apron. A button at the waistband. Buttons at the top. Isn't it cute? I am so extraordinarily pleased. I really, really am. I am just really, really happy with it. Um, I think you guys are going to be really excited when I get this one done into a pattern. And I would really, really try to hurry up on this one because it's a fairly simple pattern. Um, so I think we can do it. What makes this even better? is I have, uh, I've got the copy of the delineator that it's in. And that was a picture you saw the other day. And I know it's the same dress, the same apron, dress, apron. This apron would almost change the whole look of your dress. You could have a really plain dress on and 
this apron would just snazz it right up. So, see, it's the same apron. What is also really nifty in this particular uh, delineator is there are two more aprons with the pointed yoke on the front that should be really easy to adapt once we have this pattern finished from this pattern. So it should get you a, uh, get a three for one on the pattern, on the apron styles. So I'm very, very, very excited about that. Uh, the other thing is some of you noticed when, uh, when it was first shown, when I first showed the picture, that it had cross stitch um, on it. And it very definitely does. Um, I'll read to you from the Fashions for October. It says the apron is here, is pictured, developed in checked gingham with bias bands of plain gingham for trimming. The skirt extends almost to the bottom of the dress and its back edges meet at the center of the back at the waistline and flare widely below. Um... It also talks about the fact that on the other page, it talks about the fact that it is, the gingham is embroidered. So let's see if I can find the figure 404. I'll read to that. 402, 403, 404, ladies working toilet. The apron here is pictured developed in blue and white check gingham. The skirt covers nearly the yoke. It is decorated near the bottom with an effective cross design done with cotton in a prettily contrasting hue. Directions for making the cross stitch as well as many other useful and artistic stitches will be found in articles entitled Fancy Stitches and Their Application now progressing in the delineator. So, we go back to the back of the delineator and we look for fancy stitches and their application. And there's the patterns. So, all, all of these, all of these things will be included um, when the pattern goes out. Um, I said it should be easier to develop this as a pattern than in developing a dress because there's less fitting and less variations on instructions that are going to be needed. And I want to get started on this one pretty quick. I'll probably do a master up because I need an apron to enter in the fair anyway. So I'll probably be doing a master up pretty quickly because the fair is next week. Um, not this coming weekend, but the weekend after that. So I'll, I'll probably be doing a, a, a trial run off of the pattern pretty quickly. Um, I just, I really do love it. Um, I also said I was going to talk a little bit about why um, patterns from indie uh, pattern makers cost a little more. Um, we really, really, there's a lot of expense that goes into making a really great historic pattern. My feeling is to get a pattern that is correct. You really need originals to look at. You really need to be able to place it in its time frame. And so all of these things, all of these things I think are really, really important. To do that, that means you either have to go to a lot of museums and do research or you have to add to your own collection. Um, I am very rural. rural. Um, I live out in the country. Uh, so adding things to the collection is probably one of my easier options. 
it is not the least expensive option out there. So sometimes I will find a dress that I'm just sure that people will love. And I decide, okay, I really need to produce this piece in a pattern so other people will have access to it. And I have run up against people saying, well, you ought, you ought to be able to sell those cheaper. You ought to be able to, you know, you should share this with everyone. And I try, I really do try hard to be a good sharer um, and to help point people towards correct historic clothing, um, help them find how to do things in historic ways. But on the same note, I have put years and years of research into things and I add to my collection so that I can share it. But if I don't make some back off of it, I will no longer be able to add to my collection and share it with you. So I'm going to be honest about what I paid for this apron. Um, it cost me $100. Actually about 110 by the time I paid shipping. So that's one thing, $110. Um, it will probably take me to take a good starting pattern off of it. It will probably take me maybe four hours to take a good starting pattern off of it. Now that's because this is going to be an easy pattern. A dress can take much, much longer. So apron like this will take me about four hours. A dress might take me anywhere from eight to 12 hours to take a pattern. So we're just going to go with this apron. So we'll say four hours. Um, I think skilled labor, fair price to pay for skilled labor per hour is about $20 an hour. So figure we're at $190 um, for the apron and for my labor of taking it off. That's not counting any pencils, specialty rulers that I have, uh, any of the equipment that I already own. So we're not, we're not counting any of that, the paper or any of the equipment. Um, then we go into documenting it because you might have a piece of clothing, but you really need to know what time frame it fits in accurately. This one I can date when the pattern was released because it's a very obvious match. So I can say, well, it's 1891. Well, now, how do I know that? because I purchased the delineators. Delineators usually cost me around $20 a piece, um, more or less. Sometimes I pay more if it's one that I really want, and sometimes I find some that are a little bit less. So we're gonna average about $20. Well, for this particular pattern, for the embroidery documentation and for the apron documentation, I needed two of those. So we were at $190 and we just added another 40. So we now have $230. That is just, just the research part of this. So, okay, so we've got about $230. Now, how long does it take me to draw out a pattern? You're t looking at another probably, oh, this is a pretty simple pattern. You're probably looking about a day's worth of work. So another eight hours um, probably needed to draw a decently, uh, decent range of sizes for this pattern. In fact, it's probably going to be about eight hours for the larger size range and about eight hours for the smaller size range. Um, it, I may or may not be able to adjust that a little bit um, because this one is a little bit more fitted than the average apron. So we'll just give it another eight hours. That's another $80. So we're 230. We're now up to about 310. Um, we're not counting the fact that my printer is a $4,000 printer. Um, we're not counting about the fact 
that I have to buy my paper to print on a roll at a time at $70 a time. So all of these things add up. Now, not counting any of the paper, not counting any of the printing, just the work I've put into it. If I sell these patterns for $15 a piece, um, even figuring straight 300, if I sell these patterns for $15 a piece, just to break even, I have to have a fairly large amount of patterns just to pay for what I've put into my research. Now, again, I truly believe in being able to provide access to things like this. And I know everybody can't afford to buy a hundred dollar apron. <laughs> so I, I, I understand that. And so I'm taking this load on myself, but it really helps me when people buy a pattern, when, if you can afford to do so, if you buy your own pattern and not share patterns between you, um, that really, really helps me be able to move forward and to find wonderful pieces like this. So I know I have a nice collection. I've got a, I've got a very nice collection. I've been very, very blessed at being able to find things. Um, and I've done hours and hours and hours of research trying to make sure that my patterns are accurately described, that I put uh, images in there so that you can understand how they're put together, um, and so that you can produce the best historical clothing that you can produce. Um, but this is, again, this is where I need your help. When the patterns are released, buy one. That helps me, that helps me not get in quite such a funk. Um, I had, before I released Molly, my children's uh, dress pattern, I had a lot of people that were asking for a little girl's pattern. And when it was released, I really, I probably haven't sold, I probably haven't sold 20 Molly's yet. I probably haven't sold 20 of them yet which means I'm probably well behind the curve on what I ought to be for the amount of research and development that went into that. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, pattern makers like myself um, that do this type of thing, that find the originals, do the research, and try to put it out there for you guys to be able to use, it really, really helps us out when you support us by buying, um, buying our stuff. Um, when we release a pattern or when we put a little uh, pamphlet out that shows you the detail of how something works, um, we, we really do. We try to keep it down. We try to keep the price down. Um, but there's a lot of our time and a lot of our heart and a lot of our soul that goes into developing these and and to to helping other people get a close up look at uh, some of what we're doing. So that's my little mini lecture today on why uh, indie patterns often cost more than uh, it would be if you could go to Joann's and buy a pattern from the big three. Um, but know that we're putting a lot of our own. Uh, time in there and we're not selling in bulk like you can uh, for a, a night nationwide uh, a big print shop like that we, we cannot afford to go that far ahead on most of our patterns so support your local indie pattern maker yay the small businesses that love to do the history support them uh, not just me. There's lots of great pattern makers out there um, that will that that do the research and share the research with you through the patterns, and you should 
do your best to support them so that they can keep on doing what they love to do and sharing it back with you. And yeah, if you see any really cool aprons, let me know because I do love good aprons. So you want to look at it one more time? Front. Let's raise her arm up a little bit so you can see how it attaches there. So isn't this a lovely slimming line? I just love the lines of this. I think it's just going to be so fun on. And that nice pocket. That's, that's, that's a great pocket, guys. You know the things you can hide in a pocket like that? That's just a really awesome pocket. And this bias, see it's put on the back and then turned to the front and then top stitched down. That's a great use of bias. Really, really is. So this is a slightly heavier fabric. This is actually probably, this is probably slightly heavier. This is like a heavy grade of quilting cotton. Um, it's been starched. They just really, really done a lovely job on this. I bet they were really proud of themselves. The, the top is not lined. It's a single layer too with the bias turned to the outside. And you can make this wider or narrower bias. A, a narrower bias, a narrower bias might be a little bit easier to handle. And then lapel goes like that, just turns down and lays so pretty. And it, it makes us, it makes a, the dress look like a whole different dress, doesn't it? <laughs> I think this is just, I think it's just a darling little pattern. So stay tuned. We'll see what I can get done for the fair in making a mock-up and how it's going to work out. And I don't, I honestly don't know what, I don't know what color I'm going to use. I don't know what fabric I'm going to use. Um. You may get a few updates um, from the Instagram when I light upon what I'm going to do because I'm not positive if I'm going to try to d get one done with gingham for the fair or not because I don't think I've got time to do the embroidery because I've got quite a few other things I've got to do. Um, but I will try to get what a mock-up finished. And... We will see you guys later. I hope you enjoyed it because I was very excited for it to get here. So I'll see you guys later. Toodaloo! Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this morning I thought I'd talk with you a little bit more about what goes into uh, what goes in what kind of work goes into the pattern. So yesterday I almost finished up a first incarnation version of the new pattern. Um, I haven't decided what to name her yet. She's a very, very, very cool apron pattern. So I almost finished up the first version, the 1891 uh, pattern um, for the apron. There's some stuff that's wrong. So as you see this apron, there are things that I'm going to need to change. Um, things that I didn't quite get right the first time around. And I'll point those out in a second. Um, but just so you know, 
I don't work nine to five. <laughs> so um, instead of having a job where it would be uh, you know, going to work and coming home at a set certain hour. I tend to work in hours when the rest of the household is out of my way or sleeping, which generally means um, very early in the morning into late at the night. So I was pretty excited about this pattern. And some of you may have seen my quick uh, first draft done in time lapse video. Um, that I did late in the evening on the first day I got it. Um, so I was pretty excited about that. Oh my goodness, what is today? Wednesday. So Monday afternoon, I got the pattern, unboxed it. I got the... Monday afternoon, I got the apron, unboxed it, and showed it to you guys. And then I needed to go through some more steps so that it would be ready for patterning. Uh, so some of the things that I use are, um, I use a cardboard cutting mat and I use very fine, very sharp straight pins to hold it down. Um, it's only traced with pencil. Um, I've got a pencil that I use, uh, a mechanical pencil that so I use too. So I... We'll go through and I will make uh, tracings uh, of it. Um, seam allowances have to be added. And then after I've got a master pattern from an original, I have to go about um, making it into a size that fits now. So instead of just grading up, which generally results in something that doesn't fit terrifically um, and it doesn't really work with our modern sizings and the way we lace our corsets and all of these things. Um, so I will take a master sloper pattern um, and I usually start with my size uh, because if I goof something up then it's mine to goof up. So I will start off with my size and I'm also kind of at the mid-range of both of my size ranges. So I'm kind of at the overlap point. I'm about a 42 inch bust, so it's at the overlap point. After I get a master pattern made, um, then I will go and I will see how that works with my slopers and how I can use those to turn it into the correct shapes. So that makes two patterns that I've now done for this. Um, after I get to that point, then I kind of try the pattern on and I make a few little adjustments and then that's usually a third pattern. And after I get to that point, then I cut that third pattern out and I make it up in a muslin and make any little adjustments that needs to be done from there. So that makes the fourth pattern. So by the time it's in this incarnation, um, we've gone through four separate patterns um, from the one directly taken from the historic piece through one that fits in my size and a couple of adjustments. And then we make it up. And part of the making up is you need to see what order the steps go in logically. And I'll admit I had to take out seams three times on this one because I didn't follow a logical uh, progression and there's definitely t things that you have to do first. So like this top, the binding around the collar, um, the, that has to be done first. And so there's a definite progression of things that have to be done first. And so the first one's always a learning process for me. Um, some things that I did on this one, I'll stand up and show you, it's different than the other one. So I didn't adjust this down low enough when I sized up. So this will have to come down lower to make the lapels fold over more like this one. Yeah, that's a steeper angle. And that's a problem with the sizing going up and down on it. So... That's something that will have to be adjusted. I think this probably needs to come in. Um, th this probably needs to come in narrower at the front. 
Um, again, that's a thing when I size up, sometimes it doesn't work out quite like I think proportionately. So that will probably go up. Um, I did do something on the pockets. I made them a little bit deeper because I wanted the pocket deep enough that if I needed to put my cell phone in my pocket and hide it completely that I could do so. So my pockets are about an inch and a half to two inches deeper on this one. Um, but otherwise, and I haven't got buttons on it yet. Um, I will probably also set the gathering further back on the waistband band for the larger sizes because it didn't quite come to where I wanted it to be. But I wanted to have a little bit of extra room in the waistband so that I could let it out or somebody could borrow it. But other than that, it's turned out pretty similar to the original and I'm fairly happy with it. Um, but there's still a lot of work to go. Um, some of the things that I will need to do is I will need to write instructions. I will need to take my instructions and have somebody check them to make sure that the instructions make sense to somebody else and not just me. Um, I need to correct any of the little flaws that I found here. Um, so that'll be something I need to do. And then from this size, I will need to make a pattern in multiple sizes so that more than just me can actually wear this apron. So we still got a ways to go on this, but I just thought I'd let you know about some of more of the work that goes into making a pattern like this from an original. Keep on researching, keep on sewing, bye.